Okay, I am very excited to bring the Word of God to you. Let's turn to Scripture, Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read a historical passage to you and bring it out in a prophetic way that speaks to us today. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 1. At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, we talked about that last week, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the timing came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Skip down to verse 21. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus. The name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of the child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Father, I thank you for your word this morning and I pray that it comes alive and pierces our hearts. God, that it would bring about the work and the transformation in us that you want it to do. Lord, that it would change us forever in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Okay, let's pick up in verse 4. just read you the passage, but let's back up to verse 4. Verse 4 declares to us, And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. Now, this passage you might feel is just boring or is just read at Christmas only because it's history, right? It's telling us the facts of what happened that time when the census was issued in Rome. It's history. It's telling us facts. Well, this is a very prophetic passage that's going to speak to you and me this morning. So let me just give you the backdrop. There were no computers. There were no cell phones. There were no technology of any kind so the tracking of people meant that the families really kept records of who they were who they were descended of and their lineage it was very much a priority to them and so joseph the scripture says knew what family he belonged to there was family identity he knew it and he knew that he needed because of the edict to travel to Bethlehem. Now, the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem was 90 miles. 90 miles. There is no modern form of transportation whatsoever. But he had to go. There wasn't an online census, hit yes, no, submit, enter your email address, and you're done. They had to pick up and travel 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Mary was probably 12 to 14 years old. Jewish girls were married at this time. Marriages were arranged. Can you imagine? Mary, the mother of Jesus, being 14 years old, fully pregnant, having to travel 90 miles. That's like from Harrisburg to Baltimore, on foot or on the back of a donkey, for a census that a man issued. Okay, that's the context. A Roman Empire emperor issued this decree, a man issued this decree, and now a 14-year-old girl carrying Jesus has to travel 90 miles. Leave her home, go to Bethlehem. Jesus was going to be born where? He was going to be born in Nazareth. I understand the prophecy, but listen to me. Except a heathen man, the emperor, issued a decree. So a man issues the decree that God knew would happen. So it was prophesied that the decree would happen and that the Christ child would be born in Bethlehem. But I want you to catch this. Mary's nine months pregnant, living in her hometown of Nazareth. She's going to give birth in Nazareth. 
but a man issued an edict, a decree that altered where Jesus was born at. Now, God knew it. The scriptures prophesied it, but understand what happened, right? A Roman Empire emperor issued the decree. And so I want to pull three principles out of this passage for you. Number one principle, if you're taking notes, is Jesus goes where he is told or is invited. I want you to understand this morning that Jesus was to be born in Nazareth. The natural setup was Nazareth. That's where she lived. You don't travel 90 miles on a donkey to have a baby when you can have your baby at home. And so this edict changed according to God's plan. God knew it. God wasn't surprised. But the edict of a Roman Empire emperor changed where Jesus was born. Principle number one. Jesus goes where you tell him or where you invite him. So let's talk about this. You must understand that Jesus' activity in your life is up to you. He wants to be involved, Trent. He wants to be involved, Diane. But if you don't invite him in, he's going to stay out. It was a man that commanded the, the census to happen and it altered Jesus' location his birth if you invite jesus in he will come in and he will deliver you and he will empower you and he will change you jesus location is determined by you in your heart if you want to do your own thing if you want to be a homosexual if you want to live in sin if you want to be controlled by anger guess what jesus will let you do that your invitation is important we need to remember that our invitation is important. That we determine where Jesus can work in our heart and our life. If it wouldn't have been for the emperor, Jesus would have been born in Nazareth. If it wouldn't be for you, Brad, saying, come on, Jesus, Jesus will be stuck outside of your life. And he'll never make it in. And so we have this principle that Jesus goes where he's told or where he's invited. Luke chapter 7, verse 37. I could give you a list of these. But look at this. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. What was that? That was an invite. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Now what would have happened if the Pharisee never invited Jesus? Would they have dinner together? No. What would have happened if the Roman emperor would never have issued the decree? Where would Jesus have been born? In Nazareth. John chapter 2, verse 2, the next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also what? Invited to the celebration. Jesus traveled to and fro based on invite, and he's doing it today. He is traveling amongst us, his people, by invite. And when we don't invite, when we don't open the door, he's not able to come in. So the absence or the presence of Jesus is directly influenced by us. Jesus was not an outlaw. He was not a bandit. He was not someone that was trying to raise up an insurrection. Jesus was not a militant guy. He traveled around civilly amongst the people and went where he was invited and where they opened and welcomed him. Remember the command to the disciples in, when he sent them out two by two to find a man of what? man of peace, a man that would welcome them. Stay with those who will invite you in. We got to realize, we got to take ownership of the fact that sometimes Jesus is on the outside because I've never invited him on the inside. He will not force his way upon us. He will not manipulate us like a robot. Jesus is involved in your life as much as you want him to be. He responds to your invitation, and he respects your silence. Do you know that Jesus can come into your heart with an invite? And he can leave your heart with an invite too. Or a boot. That's who he is, and that's how this works. He is the king of kings, and he is the lord of lords, but an emperor issued a decree, and so he was born in a different location. You and I have the ability to influence Jesus ability to work in our life because he's civil he is not going to manipulate so that's principle number one that's just foundation jesus goes where he's told or he's invited 
And some of us have to face up and own up and man up to the fact that we've not invited Jesus into certain areas of our life. We're going to talk about it. The title of this sermon, if you want to title it, is, is there no room for Jesus? Is Jesus in the stable? Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Let's go to the next verse. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Guys, this is very, very prophetic and speaks to us today. I want you to focus on the last sentence. There was no lodging available for them. There was no room in the inn. 90 mile journey, traveled, obeyed the decree, get there, there's total strangers and nowhere to stay. They're on the streets. No room. Mary's pregnant with the mother of our Lord. She gets to the inn and says, sorry, there's no more rooms. Nothing was available in all of Bethlehem for a 14-year-old girl that was carrying the mother of Jesus. Guys, this was not by accident. This was history that happened to speak to the rest of the world for the rest of time this truth. Is there room in your heart for him? We're not told how, but somehow they end up in a dark cave with animals. I couldn't get you, half of you, in an animal pen in the daylight. <laughs> let alone an animal pen, a cave, in the dark. Ladies, can you imagine your first childbirth? You're 14 years old. Now, you really can't understand because you don't live outside of America. In third world nations, girls are scared to death of being pregnant and delivery because many of them lose their lives. They don't have the medical facility. They don't have the staffing. They don't have all the machines to hook you up to if you begin to bleed or there's an issue. There is not an option for C-section. And so you need to picture this. Joseph and Mary are total stranger and her water breaks on the streets in Bethlehem or in a cave next to some cows. Can you imagine this? Straw, hay, Dirt, 14 years old, in the dark, her water breaks. Labor contractions are ramping up as her body is preparing to deliver Jesus. Imagine what Mary's thinking emotionally. She's tempted to be scared because many women lose their lives at this point. But she's clinging to the promise of the angel that she would give birth to a Messiah. So you find Mary in this place, feeling rejected, exhausted, no place in the inn. She's in this dirty, nasty, dark place. Her water had to break. Now she's given birth. It's the time. Oh, it hurts so bad, right? And Joseph's like, breathe, breathe. <laughs> the pains of labor are excruciating. Mary's exhausted. But with God's help, she delivers her firstborn son, right? That's the, the context here. The setting is not cute. It certainly has not been coveted by any of you ladies that have ever lived since. None of you. You've never said, I just wish that would happen to me. <laughs> Jesus was born in loneliness. Jesus was born in obscurity for a reason. He was born with the animals. He was born where nobody saw him. He was born in an out-of-the-way place. This picture is prophetic. No room for Jesus. No room. The nature of Jesus' birth did not happen by accident. It was not just because there were too many people there. It happened because this became a picture for the rest of the world. Because Jesus would suddenly find himself in the stable for the rest of time. Because people say there's no room. I have no room in here for you. Go to the stable. Go to the stable. Jesus would become all too familiar with rejection, with being sidelined. Just as Joseph and Mary knocked, wanting to be in to, let into the inn, Jesus knocks on our heart, and oftentimes we say, there's no room. There's no room. Revelation, we know the passage, chapter 3, verse 20 says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. Sounds familiar. If you hear my voice and open the door, then I will come in. There's the invitation. We will share a meal together as friends. What is insinuated? 
What happens if we don't open the door? He won't come in. And where does he end up? In the stable. Out of the way, out of our mind. I don't have to think about Jesus. So just like Joseph and Mary were told, there's no room. But you can stay in the stable. I've got this nice stable. Oftentimes we say, Jesus, there's no room there. You can just live in this part of my life. Churches are full of people that say, there's no room in my finances for you, Jesus. So you can just stay out of that part. You can stay in the stable. Churches are full of people that say, I have no room for you in my employment. Employment. No room, Jesus. I'm going to look like the world. I'm going to talk like the world. I'm going to cheat like the world. I'm going to do it the world's way in business. There's no room for you here, Jesus. Churches are full of people that say, I have no room for you, Jesus, in my sex life. No room. No room here. But I'll go to church. I have no room for you in my addictions, but I'll go to church. I have no room for you in my family, but I'll go to church. I have no room for you in my friendships. I don't want you to speak into my friendships. I don't want to submit to the word of God in my friendships. I don't want that. There's no room here, Jesus. Go to the stable. Churches are full of people that say, I have no room for you in my entertainment. That is an area that's off limits to you, Jesus. No room. No room. You're not going to speak to me and teach me what I can watch and what I can't watch, what I can listen to and what I can't listen to. Jesus finds himself for the rest of his life, for the rest of time, being told, no room. No room. Not welcomed here. There's not space for you. There's people that say, I have no room for you in my schedule, but I'll go to church on Sunday morning. There's no room. There's no room for you, Jesus. I have no room for you, Jesus, but I will call myself a Christian and I will go to church on Sundays. Very prophetic, this delivery of Jesus. Very, very prophetic. Remember, principle number one is that he ended up in Bethlehem because of the man that said, go to Bethlehem for a decree. A man altered where Jesus was born. He gets there and another man says, there's no room, no room. So now Jesus is altered again. He's in Bethlehem, but he's in a cave. He's in the stable. He's with the animals. Here's principle number two. Jesus can be kept in the stable. All you got to do is tell him there's no room. And he'll be stuck in there. He'll be stuck. And you can keep him out of your life in the area of finances. Jesus can be kept in the stable. He can be put there and he can be kept there. The stable represents an out-of-the-way place with little importance. It represents a place I don't have to think about. It's where I store my stuff, my junk, my tractors, my animals. The stable represents third class. It represents being left out. It represents a low priority in my life. Jesus, go to the stable. That's low priority. I'll go to church. I'll wear the smile. I'll look the part. But I'm not giving my tithe. There's no way that I'm going to listen to that preacher teach me on sex. There's no way that I'm going to try to change my business practices and function according to Christ. Go to the stable, Jesus. Go to the stable, Jesus. He should be in every part of our lives. He should be welcomed into the inn. But instead we say, there's no room, go to the stable. We have the power to either keep Jesus in the stable or to invite him to come into every part of our lives. Open up every door, every chamber in our heart. We either open the door or we do not. He is knocking. So principle number one is that Jesus goes where he's invited and where he's told. Number two is we see that Jesus can be put into an out-of-the-way place and put in the stable. Let's go on to read Luke chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus. The name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
This is powerful. You've got to catch this. According to the Mosaic Law, all male children were to be circumcised. It was scripture. It was to happen on the eighth day. It was the pattern. It was the design of God. Let's read it. Luke, Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. On the eighth day, the boy's foreskin must be circumcised. It's in the Old Testament. It's the law. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 6. Catch this. When the time of purification for the woman is completed for either a son or a daughter, the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for purification offering. She must bring her offerings to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle. Understand, this is the way the Jews and the people have been living for thousands of years. Here is Mary, a devout Jewish girl. This is the law. It's the scripture. It's the word of God. Jesus is born in a cave, and she knows this. And so, on the eighth day, what did they do? Jesus was circumcised. That's what we just read. The baby was circumcised. He was named Jesus. Then it was time for the purification, which is what? To present yourself at the temple with a lamb, with a turtle dove, to have this purification offering. So now you find that Mary and Joseph and Jesus, where are they at? Bethlehem. Where do they need to be? They need to be in the temple. In Jerusalem. What is it that got Jesus out of the cave, out of the stable? Okay, a decree, but it was the word. It was what? Scripture. What is it that gets Jesus out of the stable in your life? His word. Obedience to his word. What would have happened if Mary and Joseph said, oh, that's crazy. We just traveled 90 miles. God, will, well, he won't care. We're not going to circumcise him on the eighth day. We'll do the purification when it's easier because it's a trip from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. What would have happened if they, didn't dis, if they didn't obey the scripture? Where would they be? In the stable. It was obedience to the word of God that took Jesus out of this place of obscurity and put him back where he needed to be. Did you catch that? That's powerful. On the eighth day, when the time of purification had come, according to the scripture, they left this out-of-the-way place that man had put them in, and they came back, and they were back on track, functioning according to the way God wanted them to be. Principle number three, Jesus comes out of the stable when scripture is obeyed. Jesus remains in the stable. Jesus remains in the out-of-the-way place. Jesus is stuck there until we obey scripture and then he is allowed to come out of the shadows out of the fringes of our heart when we say god i want to obey your word in this area god i want to bring my tithes god i want my sex life and my marriage to honor you god i want the word of god to be lived out in my life he comes out of the stable he comes out of the darkness and he's right there with us until we diligently apply the scripture, Jesus is locked up in the out-of-the-way place. He's in the stable. Every time we knowingly or unknowingly disregard the scripture, the precious scripture, we're telling the Lord, there's no room here, go to the inn. When we obey the word of God, it's opening the door and he comes in and he fellowships and he empowers and he changes it's the key. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. I wrote these, and I'm going to read them to you. They're very pointed. They're very direct. But I want you to see this because I want you to connect dots. God is going to speak to hearts this morning because we all have stables where we've tucked Jesus. We all have them. Areas we don't want him. There's no room here. Go to the stable. Here we go. Fred is 15 years old. He's a typical teenage boy with his eyes on the girls. Fred is a Christian who regularly attends church. He's learning to have quiet time with Jesus on a regular basis, and he's growing a lot in spiritual maturity. Fred is showing signs of future leadership in the church. He's a solid young man that's respected by many. Along comes Alyssa, 
an attractive 16-year-old whose family recently moved to town and began attending Fred's church. Fred's instantly attracted and begins to pursue a relationship with Alyssa. Several leaders in the church pull Fred aside to gently counsel him on the relationship, but Fred wants nothing to do with that counsel. He's convinced that God's leading, it has to be God's will, and he doesn't want godly counsel around him, who he has judged as old school and legalistic. Fred may be growing in Christ, but when it came to the area of dating, where was Jesus? In the stable. There's no room here, Fred says. You just go in the stable. I got this. Don and his wife Emily were first generation Christians. Neither one grew up attending church. Don and Emily were raising their family in church and were actively serving in the ministry. Their family was considered an integral part of the church because they did so much and worked so hard. Every Sunday, Don and Emily gave some cash in the offering plate. However, their cash offering did not even come close to being a tithe. Don and Emily both had good jobs, making well over 100,000, six figures annually. But they refused to put Christ first with their tithe and instead chose to spend their money on vacations, four-wheelers, tractors, vehicles, their property, you fill in the blank. On the outside, Don and Emily look to be the perfect Christian that was obeying Christ in all areas of their life. Yes, they served at church, but they did nothing to support the kingdom financially, and they selfishly left that responsibility to everybody else, undercover, under the radar. The reality, when it came to their finances, they had Jesus locked up where? In the stable. And they were telling him, there's no room for here. You stay in the stable. I'll look the part, and I'll do what I want to do. I'll let you in where I want you to be, but there's no room here. Ryan and Sarah had been married for five years. Paul and Linda were married for 35 years. Both couples tried their best in public to make their marriages look great. However, behind the bedroom door, it was a totally different story. Both marriages were struggling with physical intimacy, past experiences, sexual partners, a lack of emotional intimacy, poor communication, and pornography were influencing their love life. Both couples were Christians. Both couples love Jesus, but they wouldn't make room for him in their sex life. Pride, embarrassment, an unwillingness to get help from a counselor or a pastor was telling Jesus, there's no room here. Go to the stable. Gilbert is the kind of guy that can do anything. He's the one that you look at and wonder, where is this guy going to be at in 10 years? Phil is the total opposite. He lacks ambition in life and dearly loves his video games. Both Gilbert and Phil are busy guys, but their busyness is very, very different. Gilbert has every minute in his day planned out. He lives with purpose. Phil doesn't have a clue how to plan. He just goes with the flow. Gilbert and Phil both attend church. They're engaged in the young adult Bible study. They attend the fellowships. They participate in the events. They're what you'd call a Sunday Christian. Why? Because neither Gilbert nor Phil have what? Room for Jesus. Gilbert won't make time for Jesus, and Phil doesn't have the personal discipline for Jesus. Both men have Jesus locked in the stable, And there he is, outside, knocking, and they're saying, there's no room in the inn. I have no room in my heart. Their daily choices tell Jesus, there's no room here. Christian, let me tell you, we all have stables that we have ushered Jesus into and closed the door. Areas that we do not want him to mess with. We don't want to deal with it. The story of Jesus is, yes, historical, but it speaks to us today. We all have these areas that we want him to stay out of. And so we say, no room, no room. But let's take a look at the same story, and let's see what it looks like to open the door to Jesus. Fred made a poor decision that put him and Alyssa in a very compromising situation. He loved Jesus and really wanted to honor God in his dating relationships. However, 
He came to the conclusion that without godly counsel from others, he was sure to make major mistakes that he would regret. So he went to his pastor and several other trusted leaders and sought their advice. Proverbs 15, 22 is what Fred began to live by. Plans go wrong for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. When Fred began to allow godly authority to speak into his dating relationships, he began to obey the scriptural pattern and automatically he made room for Jesus. He searched out the scripture. He began to obey it. With godly counsel, Fred was able to navigate interaction, interaction with the opposite sex in a way that upheld purity and honored both God and girls. Several years later, Fred proposed to a different young lady named Lisa. Had he not made room for Jesus and obeyed the scriptural teaching to involve godly counsel, Fred admitted he would have gone down the wrong path. Church, young people, most young people have Jesus in the stable. There's a way, there's a way for it to be done right. Fred came to that conclusion. Don and Emily became very convicted one day about the years they had robbed God of the 10% tithe. They looked at their budget, realized something had to go. They repented before the Lord, sought the counsel of their pastor, and even consulted their financial planner. Hard decisions were made, but they took control of their money and began to give God his tithe. Look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? Where did we ever cheat you? You've cheated me of tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there may be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, then I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have a room enough to take it in. Try it. Put me to test. When Don and Emily obeyed God, he did as he said and he blessed them. They brought him from the stable into central the inn, into the central part of their heart. They obeyed him. When they listened, when they obeyed, they made room for Jesus. They put him first like he was supposed to be. Ryan and Sarah and Paul and Linda's marital intimacy issues continued to fester until each one of them began to apply scripture in their marriage. Remember, it's scripture that brings Jesus out of the stable. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Husbands and wives... Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Until there's submission, mutual submission there happening in a marital relationship, there's going to be issues. Ryan and Paul, as husbands, began to apply the scriptural commands to love their wives, being quick to listen and slow to speak. Guys, instead of fixing her problem. <laughs> until we begin to function according to scripture. We're going to have Jesus locked in the stable. So Ryan and Paul began to diligently seek out the scriptures. What does God have about, to say about my role as a husband? Sarah and Linda began to apply the scriptural commands given to wives. They respected their husbands. They submitted to them and they did not withhold intimacy from them even when they did not like it or feel like it. You know what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 7.5? Do not deprive each other. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about sex. Don't deprive yourselves. Women, don't hold that over your husband. Except by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. So when Ryan and Sarah and Paul and Linda diligently searched out scripture, began to apply that scripture in their, in their life, they began to see marital distance be resolved. It didn't happen overnight. Both couples began to see, though, night and day differences in their marriage as both of them applied scripture and didn't function out of wounds and just function out of what I want. But what does God have to say? Something happened and room was made for Jesus. He was brought in out of the stable and he was allowed into their lives. Gilbert and Phil attended a conference on personal revival. The keynote speaker preached a powerful message called Fanning the Flames. Both men realized at the conference that they were not putting God first in their lives and that they were not daily seeking his face. They were deeply convicted by their lukewarm living that claimed Christ but did not seek Christ. 
So Gilbert and Phil came home from the conference, called their pastor, and requested to be personally discipled. Their obedience opened wide the door for Christ to come in out of the stable. Lauren, you can come to the piano. We're going to wrap this up, but here's the point. God is bringing these three principles home to us today. We're wrapping out 2020. And the bottom line is there is issues. There are places in our life, in our heart, that have been festering, that we have not allowed Christ in. And he's wanting in. He's knocking. And there is a call for you to obey God's word, to seek God's word out, and to specifically acknowledge that you've had Jesus in the stable in 2020. It might be an addiction. It might be a character flaw. It might be you fill in the blank. But it's an area that you know that you know that you sidelined him. And you said, there's no room. There's no room. Go to the stable. Go to the stable. Jesus came into the world to be the Lord of our life. That means he came to be number one. He didn't just come to save us. He came to be the Lord of our life. He came in the form of human flesh, and we have this historical story played out. But under the wrapping, under the surface of the text, we find this theme to where the entirety of humanity is being asked the question, will you make room for Jesus? Will you let him in? Or are you saying, sorry Jesus, there's no room for you, but I'll attend church with a smile. I'm not going to disciple one-on-one, but I'll attend church. I'm not going to evangelize, but I'll attend church. I'm not going. There's no way I'm going to talk to anybody about my personal sexual struggle. It isn't happening. Despite the fact that scripture says, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. I'm not doing it, Jesus. You can just shut up. You can go to the stable. There's no room there. I mean, I could read you pages of scenarios. I gave you four or five. What is it that you have said No, I don't think so. What areas of your life have you kept closed off? What parts of your life do you refuse to obey the scripture? What parts of your heart have you said to him, there is no room here? We have a couple minutes. We're going to, Lauren's going to sing a song. We're going to respond to the Lord as we close this year out. We need to specifically respond to God. And repent and begin to apply scripture. So let's pray. I'm going to ask that you come to the altars. If you want prayer, grab an elder. Elder George and Anna are here. Elder Jay and Stacy. Elder Greg will be available. We're going to respond. We need prayer. We can have prayer. But we're going to specifically respond to Jesus and see what happens. We'll probably do a soft dismissal. We'll see. Don't get caught up in that. But you need to face the pain. You need to face the stable. You need to say, I'm sorry, Jesus, for putting you in the stable. That needs to happen today. And let me just throw out one more question for you to think about. If you have Jesus in the stable, that means you need to be discipled one-on-one. So what mature Christian are you feeling drawn to? Says, I want to be like that person. I want to be mature in Christ like that person. I want to function like that person. Who is it that you're drawn to? And you need to begin to pray about the possibility of one-on-one discipleship. Going through the green book. Establishing relationship. Don't keep Jesus in the stable church. The plane is going down the runway to take off. If you got too much baggage in there, you're not going to make it. You're not going to fly. It's time to get him out of the, get him out of the shadows. Get him out of the stable. It's time. It's time. Father, we thank you this morning for the word of God that speaks to our hearts, that pierces us, that convicts us. Lord, I thank you for speaking to your church, your people. Lord, I thank you that we've come face to face with the realization today that we have said there's no room 
For many of us, it's been unknowing. We've done it without even realizing it. But Lord, today is a day that you're seeking us out and you're re-knocking on the hearts and you're looking for us to open the door and let you into the soul wound, the hurt, the broken relationship, the marital conflict that just exists, those areas of Christian life that you just are bucking. Lord, you, you've called us to open the door. So Lord, I pray right now that you would touch each one Lord, that you would convict even further. Lord, allow us to not just ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but let us respond in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to encourage you to get out of your seat and come to the altar. You can, you can talk to God in your seat, but come, come to the altar and just say, God, I want to get you back. I want to let you in. Step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Just close your eyes and worship the Lord. You don't need to look around. Lord, we're here to worship you. We're here to put you first. Speak to us, God. Lead us to the scriptures. Yes, Lord. Come in, Lord. Come in. We welcome you. On church I'm going to call it again there's more stables out there than this there's so more stables there's more places that Jesus is kept from respond to the Lord get prayer from an elder respond to him Lord we hear you calling Yes, Lord. Yes. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon Speak to us, Jesus. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. Speak, Lord Jesus. Speak, Lord Jesus.
Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. share something with you. I hope it might help you when you come to a temptation as far as maybe having an uh, extramarital affair or, or pornography. Thank you, Lord. Okay. The Jewish people, when they get up in the morning, they quote what is known as the Shema. Every morning, I will love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I've been tempted many times. Many times. When I think of that scripture, how can I honestly say, Lord, I love you if my heart wants to go from you yes. into an area where it shouldn't be? And I start thinking, what would this do to my family? What would this do to her family? Because sin has consequences. And I think of the scripture in Job. And I hope this will help you, especially you married men. Job said this, I think it's in the, the 31st chapter, of the first verse. He said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I hope that will help you whenever you come to that place where you're tempted by the tempter to go in that area that you think about what I just said. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Continue to speak, Lord. Speak, Lord Jesus. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and So this has been on my heart for weeks and I have shared it with a couple people but I just it has to come out um, so this is from the book of Exodus um, when the Israelites are traveling um, and uh, they went three days with no water and no food and they came to a body of water and its name was Mara the name of that water means bitterness and and the people were so thirsty and they came to it and the water was too bitter to drink. And God commanded Moses to throw a log into that water and that water then became sweet. And all those that came to that water, water's edge were then refreshed. And God is just saying that we had an awful year and we have we've let our guards down we try so hard to protect our hearts but so much has gotten in and we've become bitter and all those that come to us seeking light and hope and joy and peace and seeking that just that refreshing they come to water that is bitter and that's being poured out and they can't drink it you have to let these things go you have to pray them out you have to bring them to the altar and just let them down it's been a very hard year but God God threw that log into you and you were made sweet. So let them down.
down to all those that come to you, that they may be refreshed, that they may have what they need. You are the light. God in you is the light, and it is for them. Give it to them and stop holding these things. God bless. I don't know what else to do. Just I pray for purity. I pray yes, for Lord. wholeness. I pray for completeness. Yes. I pray that you understand what it means to be holding things. I pray that you know what this altar is. It's a place that you kneel and give him everything. Pray to him. Love to him. Be peace and whole and free. I was so broken when I came to this church and I'm whole and complete because yes. of Jesus. Yes. Come to this altar and kneel to your God who's given you everything. I have brain damage. I have everything I could ever think. I lost my children. I lost my husband. I lost everything. I have been homeless and I have everything now because of Jesus. Give yes. him everything. Yes. Give him every moment of everything. Yes. Give him everything. Yes. Because he is so worthy. Yes. Let him out of the stable. Yes, Lord. Amen. 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 Elder George. Yes. As we stand as the children of God and we behold what the pastor talked about this morning where our Savior is standing at the door and knock, many of us are afraid to let him in. We're afraid to discuss the things like sex or anything that, that may be offensive that we may think the Lord is offensive. But I want to remind you that the Lord Jesus said, I came not to condemn the world, but through the world that you may be saved. He is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He wants to sit across from that table to you, with you, face to face, talking with you. There's nothing that's too hard for the Lord to hear. Why? Because he already knows it. There's no sense in trying to hide it. Don't condemn yourselves. Jesus said to the, the woman caught in adultery, he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So welcome him in with joy in your heart and the peace that his love will take care of any situation that you're facing. He can break every chain, every chain. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a final song just in the presence, the sweet presence of the Lord.